This is Geek Gab with your hosts, John, Brian, and me, Daddy Warpig. We are back. That's right, Geek Gab for Saturday, August 27, 2016. Coming to you live from the house of the gremlins. That's right. I have paid highly paid technicians to come out here and go over every single inch of the old homestead, vanquishing every single gremlin they can find. Unfortunately, it seems as if they have merely driven them out of their house and into the home of our illustrious guest today. The guest of the show today being P. Alexander, Castalia House columnist and editor of Kursova Heroic Fantasy and Science Fiction Magazine, who has requested quite humbly and graciously that we refer to him as Alex during the rest of this interview instead of having to ask him before every single question. Excuse me, P. Alexander, Castalia House columnist, the editor of Castalia, of Sosova, Historic Fantasy and Science Fiction Magazine. I understand that you are currently running a Kickstarter to subscribe to issues three and four of your magazine. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct, Daddy Warpig, and uh, thank you guys for having me on. I have been experimenting with using Kickstarter to sell finished products, something which very few people seem to be willing to attempt to do these days. That is utterly and, revolutionary. Yes, we've, we've had two Kickstarters so far, one for the first issue and one for the second issue, where all copies managed to ship two weeks after the Kickstarter ended as soon as the money cleared through the banks. This time we are trying to do a Kickstarter for two issues at once, doing something of a micro-subscription to carry us out through the rest of 2016 and raise money to buy stories for 2017. I have a Kickstarter that I invested in in, I think, 2011 that has as of yet not shipped. I spent $150 on this Kickstarter, and the only thing I got out of it was the picture I use on my Daddy Warpig account. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Well, so far we have shipped out uh, lots of stuff, soft covers, digital versions, some really nice hardcover editions with dust jackets that are really gorgeous, so this time we're hoping that people will trust us enough with their money that we can hold on to it for a couple months before our winter issue comes out. So Alex, speaking of what you've done with your money, I cannot help but notice that today we have two avatars by famed artist Kukurio, and I believe that yours has a particular significance to your magazine, is that correct? Uh, to the extent that John Carter of Mars is one of the most important sword and planet stories ever written. Here, here. Also, it uh, goes hand in hand with one of our contributors, James Hutchins, who's been doing a long form poetic adaptation of the first Princess of Mars book. We've got the first two parts and the first two issues. Hopefully, we'll be able to continue it next year. Yeah, I really enjoyed that in the uh, preview issue I got. The, that's just a, a copy of an old Frazetta painting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, the it's an homage to the old Frazetta cover of Princess of Mars with V and Vivian as John Carter and Dejah Thoris. I have a copy of Princess of Mars number one, number two, I was actually a supporter of Kosova Magazine on Kickstarter. Um, did I just say that wrong or right? I can't even remember. I'm so tired right now. Um, got time, Kosova with a hard C. Uh, before they shipped the first issue, if you look inside, 
the classified ads of the very first issue of Kursova magazine, there is a classified ad from Daddy Warpig in there. So I was on board with Kursova before they shipped the very first issue. That's how much, how excited I was for a, uh, a heroic pulp fiction short fiction market. I was so thrilled when I read about it on Jeffro Johnson's website. Jeffro Johnson at the time had not yet begun writing for the Castalia House blog. I had started reading his stuff about Appendix N and just started reading through some of the books he recommended. I was so excited I jumped on the Kickstarter and paid enough to get my own ad in there. So why uh, did you start doing... I noticed with this Kickstarter there isn't spots in there for ads. Is there any particular reason why you shifted away from that? Uh, well, part of it was there weren't many people buying advertisements, unfortunately, so we're handling them just through the website, and also the logistics of selling the advertisements through Kickstarter with all the things that we're offering backers, it would have just been too crazy, because we have a limited amount of space, but we have all sorts of combinations of stuff you can get. I mean, you could back for multiple copies, you could back for soft cover, you could back for hard cover, you could back for both soft cover and hard cover, and so we didn't want to just create even more confusion by saying, well, you can back for a soft cover and also back for the advertisement. It, it just it was a mess. Selling advertisement through Kickstarter just didn't seem to be working for us. It, it simplified things. Yeah, it simplified things. Okay, so stepping away from the... Um, now, the Kickstarter still has, what, two weeks left? Yeah, it's got about two weeks. We're rounds about $450 shy, but uh, I think we're going to make it. Which is a jump of, like, 50 bucks since I checked in this morning. Yeah. Um... What was it that made you decide to start a brand new short fiction marketplace, playing, playing, paying semi-pro rates, by the way, um, it, it, unless I've got that wrong? Yes, we are paying semi-pro rates. We are a semi-pro zine. Uh, paying semi-pro rates when the smart money is on short fiction being a slowly dying marketplace right now. What, what made you decide to start that? Uh... Well, there were several factors. The most important one probably is, of course, Jeffro Johnson and his work on Appendix N and at Castalia House, coinciding with me happening upon an impressive flea market cache of old planet stories and thrilling. And I started getting into those and just absolutely loved what I was finding. And just comparing that to some of the other stuff I've read, it was just so far above and beyond. The other big thing is the Sad Puppies 3 debacle. Hmm. Now, I first found out about Sad Puppies 3 as a game blog writer because I was a fan of Jeffro. I thought it was really cool that people in the science fiction sphere were taking a look at people and paying attention to what was going on in the game blogging community. What I did not know at the time was that Sad Puppies were apparently Hitler. <laughs> well, everyone knows that. <laughs> were you? Yeah, so like, were here you actually I on I'm Mars? Excited because some game blogger I follow has been nominated or picked for a slate for a nomination for a prestigious award, and as soon as I mentioned Sad Puppies, everyone's like, oh my god, that's the worst thing ever. And uh, one of my friends who I gamed with even sent me to some ridiculously hyperbolic blog link where it was, it, it was the whole arson, murder, and jaywalking thing. People <laughs> Being rounded up on the trains, sent to the death camps. Oh yeah, and Vox Day is controlling the humans. And I'm just like, oh my god, what have what have I stumbled into? But then, let me ask you for a second. When you hear that a bunch of people are writing sexist, racist, homophobic science fiction, and they want to do all these horrible things, but you know for a fact that they're not these evil, sexist, racist, homophobes. What sort of stories do you expect them to be putting forward? 
something like a serious version of the Iron Dream? Yeah, well, the gore. Thing, yeah. <laughs> I ended up being kind of disappointed by what I saw in the short fiction categories because, you know, you have stuff like If You Were a Dinosaur, My Love, and This Year's Winner, Cat Pictures, Please, but really stories like Totaled or Tuesdays with Malakesh the Destroyer weren't all that different in a lot of regards. I mean, they're sort of in the same little little area of types of storytelling. What I wanted to do was push the Overton window of science fiction hmm. short fiction in the direction of stuff like The Enchantress of Venus and The Martian Circe or Raiders of the Second Moon. Just ridiculous fast-paced action stories with awesome heroes, awesome heroines, and just bizarre and exciting exotic situations. Yeah. So, and yeah. reasons why I wanted to make Kursova a semi-pro market is because there are just so few semi-pro markets out there for this kind of fiction that I, that I have found. And so the best way to encourage this sort of fiction to exist is by offering at least somewhat decent money for it. Well, what you said reminds me of something that I saw Jeffro, I believe, say about the state of short fiction. And he said a lot of people, even the puppies, seem intent on going back to, like, Campbell or Heinlein. And he said, yeah. no, to really yeah. fully recover the genre, we need to go back to, like, Rice I'm, Burrows in the polls. It, it, it's kind of funny, because I've sort of become uh, a Malcolm Reese fan in the whole Campbellian Revolution thing. Uh, he was the the uber editor of Planet Stories throughout its entire run, and even back in the, in the 40s and 50s, Planet Stories and Astounding kind of had a rivalry, because... Astounding was seen as the more respectable and serious science fiction magazine, whereas you still had guys with swords rescuing dames on Mars and Mercury and planet stories. Modern science fiction short stories always would have had a problem with me, because I haven't been paying attention to them for a long time, outside of like selected anthologies, like I would buy, um, you know... Like, uh, Neuromancer, uh, William Gibson's anthology, I bought, like, his anthology and read it, because if I like a specific author, or a Stephen King anthology, but not, like, magazines. I haven't read a, a modern sci-fi magazine, but I did buy Isaac Asimov's Before the Golden Age, which doesn't have a single Asimov story in it, but does have, like, 30 Her Hugo Gernsback era short stories, and they're awesome. And so if I had ever read modern science fiction, I would have thrown it into the trash so fast, because I already knew what great sci-fi stories were, and I already knew what utter shit modern sci-fi short stories were. And the, the modern sci-fi stories having that quality goes back further than one would expect. When I first started doing my short reviews column, which is now being carried on Fridays at Castalia House. I had started with some 70s issues of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, and I got really lucky on the first one that I read because just about every story in it was pretty good. The other two, with the exception of one by uh, the guy who wrote, uh, who framed Roger Rabbit, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, his story was amazing, but every other story I read in there was just absolute garbage, and a lot of it is very similar to the sort of stuff that you see today, and uh, it was it's kind of funny, because reading the letters to the editor and those issues, you have people complaining about Joanna Russ saying the exact same things that a bunch of people in the puppies camps have been saying about the editors and critics of short fiction and magazines today. <laughs> Oh man, I'm looking. I'm looking at the Wikipedia entry for Before the Golden Age. It's got like uh, the Man Who Evolved by Edward Hamilton, uh, submicroscopic by. You were asking about that question, or was that Jeffro? 
on the Castile House blog, Submicroscopic by uh, S.P. Meek, um, The World of the Red Sun by Clifford D.C. Mack, uh, The Moon Era by Jack Williamson. I mean, these are Sideways in Time by Murray Leinster. I mean, these are all classic writers, classic stories, The Brain Stealers of Mars by John W. Campbell himself. And, uh, and, yeah, Ross Rockland down there at the bottom. Yeah, <laughs> Men in the Mirror, Ross Rockland. These are awesome stories. And, and most modern stories, like the cat pictures. <laughs> you were a dinosaur, my love. I mean, these are garbage. I'm not saying all modern stories are garbage, but these stories are garbage. And they're winning Hugo's. Yeah, I've been joking that uh, someone needs to write a, a parody, Sad Pepe's Please, about an AI who talks a gay pastor and talking to his wife and working things out. <laughs> But uh, another another thing, though, is like you, you hear talk about the big three, and this is one of the things that Jeff Rose harped on a lot, is that the big three, there were a lot of other writers who were considered just as big during the heyday of the big three. I mean, nobody remembers Ross Rockland, practically, but, I mean, you, you could have booted Heinlein out of the big three and put Rockland's name in there, and back in the 50s, everybody has said, oh, yeah, that that's totally right, right there. Well, yeah, because during the 50s, and, and don't get me wrong, my favorite Heinleins are the juveniles. I mean, uh, the Heinleins juveniles, I think, are brilliant. I think they're, they are, with, a, with one exception... His best work is, is our Highline's Juveniles. Ooh, shots fired. Um, <laughs> but uh, Highline's Juveniles were brilliant. But during the 50s, that's what he was. He was the juvenile writer. He hadn't started writing his adult novels, which is where all the other people outside of that, where he got to be like the big mind-blowing 60s stuff, where people who were into like the drugs and counterculture stuff were like, whoa, Highline is awesome, dude. Um but yeah, I could see that. But there was like A.E. Van Gogh, right? And E.E. E. Doc Smith. And huge, huge names that have been deliberately buried. Especially in one case. And I can't remember the guy's name, but he's deliberately buried one of the guys. And John C. Wright wrote an article about it on his blog. And I wish I could remember the name of the editor who deliberately uh, replaced E.E. Uh, e. Doc Smith, I believe it was, with uh, Clark. I, I would see. I'm, I'm pausing right now because I expected Brian to jump in, knowing the blog uh, post and remembering the name. Am I wrong? It, Have I overestimated you? Wasn't it just Campbell? No, 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 no. It was somebody. It was somebody much, much more recent. Somebody in the last like 20, 30 years. Uh, all right, did hold that. on. I know where to find it. Um, all right, we'll let Brian run off. I, I just I expect Brian to know this stuff. He's the my backup memory when I'm tired, uh, especially when it comes to like John C. Wright's blog. But anyways, this. <laughs> This is the thing that struck me so much, um, and I will take it back to a recent touchstone because it does remind me of a certain recent writer. If you've read um, any of the um, – oh, dear, now my, my brain has let me down all of a sudden. I'm sorry, my brain has let me down. Um, so I'm going to go looking up something else, and I'm going to let Alex talk while I go looking up something on my own. So two of us are scurrying off, and it's your show, man. Say whatever you want. We won't even care. I had not thought to prepare any sort of monologue-type material. But, uh, oh, here's here's something. Uh, I know that you guys uh, have remarked on the Cucurio cover, which is great, but I really have to give a shout-out to Jabari Weathers, who is our regular cover artist, who's done the cover arts for issues one, two, and three, and will soon have something for four, but he's working on a very big project for John Wick at the moment. When I first started tinkering with the idea of doing Kursova, I had no idea that I would be able to luck out on finding someone like Jabari Weathers to do the art. He is able to bring a degree of class to the publication, which I would not have dreamed possible when I first when it was just first something that I'd kind of mulled over talking with Jeffro about one day. Uh, I've, liked, I've liked all your covers. I think they've been brilliant. And uh, well, issue two is a really special cover because 
Adrian Cole is a writer whom some of you may have heard of. Back in the 70s, when he first got his start, he did it with, uh, I believe, Zebra Books or Zebra Publishing, which was sort of a B or C list sword and sorcery, sword and science fiction publication. But uh, his debut trilogy, The Dream Lords, fantastic, fantastic stuff. It's got a lot of the new wave weird, but the old school Barosian sensibilities. But they just had awful, awful, laughably bad covers. In fact, the reason that I picked it up in the first place is because I was like, man, this cover is just so weird looking, and the fact that it advertised itself as horror in the vein of Lovecraft and fantasy in the vein of Tolkien, but showed some half-naked barbarian guys fighting some weird three-eyed lizard monster with one leg. <laughs> and I'm like, there's no way this can be what it says it is. But I eventually read them and was completely blown away by them. And so I talked with Adrian Cole, and he's got a story in issue two that's the first the sealed city story since the 70s. And I said, Adrian, I want to make a cover for your Dream Lord story, and I want it to be something that you can be happy with. So I got him working with uh, Jabari Weathers, and there's finally a Dream Lord's cover that shows something that's somewhat resembling what's in a story. Here's what I was going to say about Pulp Fiction. This is why I, I really, really glommed onto the Pulp stories of, you know, published in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, uh, that especially, and I'm talking specifically in this case about fantasy, pulp fantasy, um, and Dying Earth series, uh, Faithford and the Grey Mouser, things like that. The only modern author that I have read that really comes close to the feeling of reading these uh, writes in the style of wild, crazy, amazing stuff that you're not going to find much of anywhere else because people are too into coherent world building. I'm talking about China Neilville and his Perdido Street Station and its sequels. For example, at one point in one of the books, he talks about this creature that is basically this giant ball made of ape hands rolling through the forest, just crushes things around it. You never hear anything about it beforehand. You never hear anything about it afterwards. It's just this weird, fantastic monster that appears and disappears. You don't know if it's um, diurnal, if it's a daylight monster, if it's a nighttime monster. You don't know what it eats. You don't know if there's a race of pygmy men who specifically hunt it for food. You don't know what its ecological niche is. You don't know how it reproduces. You don't know whether it grows from eggs, whether it hangs from vines, how it lives. It just shows up, it's weird and cool, and it vanishes. It's just in the story to be weird and fantastic and cool. And whereas I think that coherent world building has a place, and I'm not trying to put it down, there is so much room for fantasy worlds to have weird and cool and random stuff that's just there to be colorful and imaginative and set off pulses inside the neurons of your brain for your minds to light up and go, oh my, oh, that was so awesome. And I don't get fully explained. I just want more awesome stuff that is just there, and then it's gone. I don't have to have 500-word essays or 5,000-word essays on everything, and not everything has to fit back into a tightly coherent, built world. Okay, and by the way, real quick, the editor who sabotaged Avon Vogt's career was Damon Knight. Damon Knight. There you go. And that's what I loved about pulp fantasy in Faithford and the Great Mouser. That's what I loved about pulp fantasy in Jack Vance's The Dying Earth uh, because nobody else that I know of in modern fantasy does stuff like that except for China Melville in his three-volume. Uh, and there's another name for the trilogy, but it's the uh, Perdita Street Station and it's two sequels. Um, the Scar, and uh, the other book. Um, 
But that's the th kind of thing you get. That's why the pulp books are so awesome, is because they didn't have rules. They didn't have this narrow list of tropes to pick from that you follow down. It's, and I tried to explain this to a friend of mine. Reading modern books, which are second and third generation descendants of Tolkien, where you had Tolkien, and then you had people who played around with Tolkien tropes, and then you have people who write fantasy playing around with this subset of tropes of Tolkien. It's as if the only thing you've been able to read is Tolkienized tropes, and all you have are paintings that are painted in black and white. And you can do brilliant, awesome stuff painting only in black and white. You can do amazing grayscale paintings, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, you look over to the left and you look over to the right and all of a sudden you see this endless line of portraits painted in full color. And some yeah. of them are in red and white and some of them have a full gamut of colors. And some of them are in blue scale and some of them are in orange scale. And some of them have every single color you can imagine. And that's what running into and discovering pulp fantasy has been like for me. And that's why I was so excited for Kosova Magazine. And that's why I was so excited that I jumped on board and supported the Kickstarter for the very first issue without even reading a single word is because I love this stuff and I wanted to support it and I wanted to see more of it uh, from modern writers and I wanted to encourage modern writers to support more of it, to start writing more of it so we could have more new stuff so we could break out of this straight jacket of Tolkienized fantasy. It's not that Tolkien is bad. And it's not that the people who came after Tolkien are bad. And it's not that Brandon Sanderson stuff is bad. And it's not that the people who are going to come in five or ten years who are going to try and, and duplicate Brandon Sanderson is bad. I love hard magic. I love Larry Correa. And the fact that he's got a Sanderson-esque fantasy magic system is awesome. But I want to see people making pulp fantasy where they don't have to limit themselves to coherent world building where they can just throw wild and awesome magic stuff in there and I think that's great and I think we need more of it and I think we need more of planetary romance and sword and science and I think we need more of all of that because I think it's great. Amen. Any last words, Alex? Uh, just very appreciative to have had your support and uh if anybody wants to check us out, uh, we are at uh, cursova.wordpress.com. You can find us on Twitter at Cursova. And if you back the Kickstarter for as little as $3, you will be able to get digital copies of all four of our 2016 issues. Okay. The link to the Kickstarter is in the description of the video below, or if you're getting this through either SoundCloud, iTunes, or Google Play, it is in embedded in the file. Just do a Get Information, and the link to the Kickstarter is in there, or, of course, you can go to the uh, Kursova on Twitter or on uh, WordPress. Any last words, Brian? Yes, I'd like to remind everyone that my Dragon-nominated SF4 novel, Soul Dancer, is free today. Today is the last day of the pre free promotion. Tomorrow is the last day to register, again for free, to vote in the Dragon Awards. So, if you, like our guests and like all of our hosts, are dissatisfied with the current state of Hugo winning fiction, the Dragons are a true populist award. Anyone can vote in. No membership fee necessary. There's a lot of good stuff on the ballot besides just me. So, let's turn up and show the Chorves just how out of touch of the mainstream they are. Any last words, John? Uh, thanks for joining us, Alex. Um, I can't read or write. <laughs> we do very much appreciate you uh, uh, agreeing to come on the show, and uh, we have uh, some more authors uh, that I know, some more authors that Brian knows, and uh, possibly some more people that John might possibly know. We haven't confirmed whether he actually knows anybody yet. We have heard rumors, they are as of yet unconfirmed, that might or might not come on the show in the future. This is Geek Gab, folks. Approximately once a week, uh, we, we do this show, usually with a hefty bonus of technical difficulties. We appreciate you tuning in. We, your hosts, uh, 
You can catch us online. Links to our various blogs and stuff are, are in the description. Here on YouTube, our YouTube link is is period gd slash geekgab. That is is dot good slash geekgab. That'll take you right to our really, really long URL because we're not awesome enough yet to have a customized YouTube URL. is dot gd slash geekgab will take you right there. We have, believe it or not, after this show, 66 awesome episodes, you can listen to us. Or you can catch us on iTunes. Do a search for Geek Gab. You can catch us on iTunes on the SoundCloud. Again, do a search for, and hold on to your seats, Geek Gab. And you can now catch us on Google Play on any Android device. Thank you for joining in this week, folks. We, your hosts are signing off, but don't fret, we will be back.